Discover how to live a more playful life. The Playful Life Podcast. Here we go with Anthony Traher as your host. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first panel session of the Jock Osmete Online Edition. And uh, we're here talking about kindfulness, mindfulness, and playfulness. Lots of ness. Fullness, you know, fullness, being full, living to the full. Um, you know, giocosamente in uh, in Italian, it means it means playfully. You know, but there's this mente, which implies that you it's to do with your mind. You see, it's like being playful with your mind. So, um, so this is already very interesting. You know, it's like to be playful, to be uh, kindful to be mindful all the time. We need to be fully pre present with what we're doing. So um, Holly, uh, unfortunately, couldn't make it here this evening. So I'll, I'll just start off this session a little bit. And uh, I realized last year the importance of kindfulness in uh, a practice of mind of um, playfulness. Um, and actually, I changed the name of the festival to uh, creative playfulness and spontaneous kindfulness because it's just making these actions which are a little bit out of our normal zone of comfort and our normal like thinking just about ourselves which opens us up towards the other people and this already opens up into, into playfulness and um, I really like this whole thing about random acts of kindness where you go around doing cool things for people like the best ones or when they don't even know it was you that did them and you just get this feel good factor, which people say, why do you do this? And if we say we do it because afterwards we feel good, that's already a reason, you know? And like, um, so why would you do random playfulness things? Because they fill us up with playfulness. And that's the reason why you do them because we feel more playful. So we somehow we're also, it becomes a thing, playfulness. It's not just uh, a random thing in the air that uh, has no meaning. It has meaning because it brings more quality into our lives and 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 not if not everything we try and do lots of things we try and do are to find this state of, of lightness and, and connection with others so and and going on to to to, to mindfulness when we're fully playful i find that we are mindful automatically we don't have to do anything particularly and if i take my own personal playfulness practice which is juggling i find that i don't even really need to concentrate on what i'm doing i'm just in there and i'm in this playful state you know it's not like i have to say like right now i have to be mindful oh no i've been distracted and come back again no it's so engaging for me that i'm in there so uh this is what i wanted to talk about a little bit and uh and also, I would say also this, because sometimes we might get into a loop when we're talking about playfulness that we become, uh, we could become very self-centered and only looking for experiences that are, that are fun, you see. And we don't make the effort to make all experiences more fun somehow, you see. And um, so the invitation is um, for just to see how, th how this action of getting into playfulness goes through kindness and mindfulness as well. This is a long winded introduction, <laughs> but this is, uh, so let's just, uh, I'll just, just, I'll just pass it on to, to Catherine and uh, listen to what she has to say about it. Well, I really like the idea, Anthony, you talked a little bit about how you find connection with mindfulness when you're engaged in play. And I was started thinking about, can you go the other direction? So that, uh, you know, play is fun, at least for me, because we have the chance to explore new possibilities, new ideas, um, and just a lot of creativity comes out of play. But how could we get that started through mindfulness? If play happens in this space, where um, you know we have some type of constraint or some type of limits and we're exploring within that, 
I think mindfulness really is the way to look deeper at whether it's objects or situations or people and thinking about how those constraints, being more aware of what those what the properties are of objects or what the um, possibilities are in a certain experience can then uh, lead into play. I think that's that's a really neat idea that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, and I also really like your whole idea about kindness. Uh, kindness is so important and random acts of kindness, but how can we turn that into play? Which uh, I said, I've really spent this whole period of the um, social distancing thinking about how can we engage in play with other people in since we can't be together in physical spaces and also at the same time how can we support people there's so many people whether it's strangers that we don't know our friends and family in our community that uh, have been struggling and so how can we support them uh, so that's that's an idea i really like of how can we combine the two at the same time so which is a bit about how my project that i've been working on lately I've uh, been creating confetti rocks. I call them confetti rocks because there's, um, you know, it's not a new idea to take rocks and to write positive messages on them and leave them out for people. But first of all, I don't personally feel uh, like I have amazing artistic talents with, um, with either drawing or lettering or painting. And I wanted a way to be able to share those positive messages. So I started looking at text in magazines and um, uh, just old books and putting together um, messages from there. And instead of just leaving them out, which is a wonderful step, how could we turn that into play? And so um, it's created, instead I decided to do this whole idea of playing tag with someone. If you have uh, the separation of space and time, it doesn't mean that you still can't engage with people. So um, leaving things out and having people then be tagged as that their turn to be it and it gets passed around. Um, so really looking at that idea of can we use kindness as a um, basis for which to create and engage in different forms of play. I'd be curious to hear what some other people have to think, have to say about all this. Let's go to Natasha next. Cool, so um, I was particularly interested in this topic because um, my background is a mixture of having been playful most of my life and um, training in happiness and mindful self-compassion, mindfulness and so and, and coaching. So I'm actually um, a happiness coach as well as what I call a light-hearted creator. And I specifically say light-hearted creator because I think particularly in, and I'm, I'm on the art panel as well, but whenever people talk about creating there's a very um, easy way to go into the the serious nature of it the serious nature of creating that you are very you know high end quite kind of um take yourself yeah just take yourself too seriously about things and i think the kindness aspect and i don't really i, I found over time i don't really tend to say mindfulness because it's got a bit of a stigma associated with having to sit in a lotus position for hours and beat yourself up if your mind wanders so uh, the Museum of Happiness, which is based in London, is where I originally trained in happiness. And they describe it as sort of having a playful puppy in your head and bringing it back, so giving it focus. So instead of saying to the playful puppy, you need to stand still and look really serious, instead going, right, well, I'm going to give you a ball so that you focus on the ball over here rather than over there. Um, and so I describe it instead of mindfulness, I describe it as awareness. So just being aware and kind of in flow. And I think play is the ultimate in terms of being completely in the moment. So I am a huge escape room fan, for example. And I find that in that one hour, it's quite an expensive way of being mindful or aware in one hour, but um, in that one hour, I literally don't mm -hmm. think anything else like my complete focus is on how many cushions can I turn over how many you know how much destruction can I cause in one room to find those clues to, to kind of feel that sense of accomplishment at the end and working together and so um, 
I lead chocolate and ice cream tours in London um, back before this all kicked off. And it led to me creating happiness tours. And part of my happiness tours was doing random acts of kindness as we went through London. So I would give everyone a pouch of chocolate coins. And the game was that they had to give the chocolate coins to people in London as we went through. And it was actually, it turned out as we went through, it turned out to be a brilliant exercise in resilience because the amount of people, particularly in London, which is uh, quite famed for being skeptical and uh, having hard shell, the amount of people who looked at us and went, no, I don't want to take your chocolate coins. And the idea of doing it now, especially with social distancing and worrying about what people have touched, um, it, it lended itself to actually be quite a fun game of how, how can we give, not only how can we give kindness, but how can we get people to accept kindness? Because there was such a barrier of people being like, why do you want to give me chocolate coins? What's, what's in it for you? What's your <laughs> ulterior motive? Like, you know, how dare you try to do something good for me with no purpose? And so it led to me like, I made sashes, so we became like a hen party where we go out and give free hugs and free. But there was always that like cynicism of why, why are you doing this? So um, yeah, I, I, I love the, the topic of this panel about, because I think it's all intrinsically linked, intrinsically linked between how to be kind, how to take yourself not so seriously that everything's really weighty and you know, there's only right or wrong and how to experiment. So my background is as a scientist and it's very much about, I just see it all as a test, it's all an experiment. You kind of come in one end of the world, you go out the other end and what experiments you can make along the way to, to get there. So um, uh, I think Benji, you're, you're on the panel, so I'll, I'll pass on to you and your beautiful robot people things behind you. Hi. Oh, that's nice. Nice to be here, nice to listen to you. Um, yeah, what I wanted to share is that almost 12 years ago, I um, had a beautiful daughter that appeared in my world. And I chose to, um, because I had the possibility, I had a <coughs> grandmother that left some money for her education instead of, as most people do, putting it away for her university, I chose to um, spend the next three years of my life taking care of her. And um, at that time I was doing very large interactive installations in the contemporary art world mostly. And I kind of like took that energy and brought it into creating um, play for my daughter. And kept on doing that for, for years and I realized, mm -hmm. you know, after Towards that, that was that is basically my experiment in play is coming from these years of inventing games for my daughter. And now I have a son who's four, so I'm kind of renewing this um, this evolution that comes with um, games are very simple when they're babies and then they evolve little by little. And and what I've learned from from that experience is. Um, there's certain like really sweet spots of playing which come when there's a very simple rule, but that connected <coughs> to novelty and chaos. Um, for example, last week I was playing with my son. We had I have a bunch of coins. We found this is an amazing story as well. As one day I was like, they didn't want to go out. I was like, come on, let's go out. Maybe we'll find a treasure and we actually ended up finding a bag of coins from like 200 years ago <laughs> in the street. <laughs> so I have these coins, they're all different. They're all different shapes and weights. And, um, and um, I just pulled them out with my son and we started um, rolling them, you know, trying to get them to roll. And so every time you try to roll a different one, it has a different property. So it, it, it makes you be very focused on, on what is happening. And just noticing, you know, each time the pleasure of seeing how this coin rolls. And then, then we started making ramps and, you know, with cardboard and stuff and, and creating a, an improvised game. Out of this. And, and, and yeah, to me, this is the, um, this is where I, when I'm confronted with a very simple thing where there's an element of chaos. So this physical element of the coin that could happen, you know, there's very little control. There's a little bit of control. 
but then there's a lot of chaos and that, that gets me into a very focused and uh, present state. And um, also just being present with those around, when, in this case, you know, with my son and, and, and seeing what brings him pleasure, which, which to me connects to this, this kindness as well. And, and yeah, I've over the years have um, become quite good at this just because I've practiced it so much. So basically what can, and how can you make a game out of anything? And so a lot of times it's very simple, you know, it's sticks, rocks, um, something that um, we like to practice often in playgrounds is to make traces on the whole playground in the sand. Um, which is also this kind of like walking meditation, making lines and creating something that we leave for whoever comes afterwards. Um, which, which made me think of this, this idea of acts of, uh, a hybrid of an act of kindness and playfulness. Because it's leaving something, we don't know who, who will discover it, but um, from my experience I've seen um, how just having one big line in the sand in the whole playground um, bring so much joy to little children <laughs> to just follow that line. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and this um, you know brings bring brings me to now to the practice that um, we've started to develop with um, my partner Andrew, which is um, bringing people to play that normally wouldn't be playful and finding that like, this, this very simple um, key is getting people to do something novel that they're not used to doing. So that there's a novelty of trying something that's simple, but that somehow is challenging because it's something that you've never done or it's something strange. Um, it's just something very basic, it can be anything, right? Any material, just an idea, but just to challenge our patterns that we have in how we are in the world. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's it for the moment. And, um, yeah. Yes, yes, very nice. So, um, Yeah, I almost feel like we said everything, <laughs> but I think we can. I think we could go into this all much deeper now. So let's let's just. Um, I, I'm quite interested in, in what uh, Natasha was saying about um, people actually aren't used to accepting kindness or like positive positive attention from other people. No, so um, what I see with playfulness anyway is that we have to um, it has to be an invitation we have to make it an invitation to somebody else to so yeah it's a big step from giving someone something and them accepting it somehow so this is uh this is something to think about how to how to, to ease this passage you know and, and like what you're saying benji as well how to get people other people invite other people into play you know i mean they don't have to come into play but like more often you know like uh this is what anna marie says you know she has the maybes you know they're the people that look at people that are playing and they go like mm, i'd like to play but they don't quite have the the and they're the people you can invite for fir first of all and then they're in there playing with you, you know and then they're the people that know i'm not gonna play with it so um, anthony that yeah. reminds me of all of the uh invitations to play that we had brainstormed in the beginning before all of this started as the festival online and i like that idea benji of how you know you create just a, an experience which is an invitation for someone else to play and maybe that in itself is is an act of kindness of giving them the uh invitation or the opportunity to then experience how the, the joy and pleasure that we get from play. That's ultimately what we're doing, isn't it? Yeah, definitely.
So, um, so let, let's say um, there are, um, there's this thing about, let, let's try and talk about some differences between playfulness and kindness already. And this might help us with our, with our discussion here. Man. Um, whereas for quite a, lot, quite a lot of people, I don't know, I don't want to quantify it, but many people, they find it easy to be kind to other people, you know, and do things for them, but they find it really hard to be playful. You know, there's, with playful, there's this element where, where you are important as well, you know, and um, I just want to hear your thoughts about this as well, about like, what is the difference, what is the difference there and how, how can, how can we make our kindness gestures, let's say, more playful, you know, or our playful gestures more kindful? So, um, as I've been going through this journey, um, I think uh, Benji brings up a really good point about, um, maybe Catherine said it as well, in terms of and it's something I've been struggling with at the moment about um, how to meet people at the level that they're at. So invitation is definitely, you know, a, a really core cool point. So in mindful self-compassion or all the work I've been doing as I've developing my facilitator skills, realizing that making, making a framework where people feel safe and where they feel comfortable to accept that invitation. So I appreciate that running through, um, past St Paul's Cathedral in the centre of London, a bit like a pigeon trying to scatter all the tourists and flinging, flinging gold chocolate coins at them probably is a bit startling and there's probably a, a gentler way to introduce the idea and we've been sort of looking at hacks like without getting into the um, murky waters of offering chocolate to children, um, actually kind of bringing the parents on board as well. And I think something I've done is because I'm so far down this journey in play where I have no issue with doing that, recognizing that many people aren't on that journey or aren't that far down it. So thinking about things that have been challenging for me and how to get myself into that mindset. So um, I live in central London and I've been uh, taking the big step of starting to cycle through London, which uh, I'd never been on a bike since I was about 12. And cycling through Trafalgar Square, Piccadilly Circus, big places like that has been really, really, really scary. And so when I, so I'm trying to encapsulate that fear, which to other people isn't really something to be scared about, so that when I offer a play invitation, I can put myself into that context and think, what sort of steps can I take to make it really accessible and approachable so it's not this big, scary um, item but I, I mean language is a key thing in, in the coaching world it's huge so when I invite someone to do um, drawing I don't call it drawing because that has a whole package of expectation around it so instead I call it mark making and for dance I don't call it dance I call it movement for singing it's sound making so how to reframe it and reformat it so I've, I've been working on the word play itself and I know that some of us have been talking about this um, offline about how to get playfulness kind of um, like, because we know that it's kind, we know that it's something that has good positive effects, but how to use the language that people understand nowadays. So whether it's well-being, stress management, problem solving, using that kind of um, more accessible, media friendly language to invite people to join us and then be like, aha, did you know that you're playing at the end of it? <laughs> so yeah, I'd be interested to hear what, what others have been using in terms of how to reframe it so it doesn't seem so scary to accept the invitation. Natasha, I don't have an answer for you, but I definitely see the same challenge. So the work that I've been doing in the past year is working in schools with teachers and um, on a program called Adult Recess. So making space for the adults to play and having that same break that at least here in the States, for, for most 
school children, it's just a given part of their day. And that, you know, there's research that shows how important it is for learning and how important it is for social relationships and all sorts of, all sorts of stuff. But um, we don't outgrow that need for play. And what I've found is it's really hard to get people to engage, to, to get through that barrier of, um, yeah, okay, I will come and I, I will make the time, make the space for play. And once they do, they really love the experience, but um, it's getting them there. It's getting them past what their idea of what it could be or what it should be or um, that it's this idea that it's something, it's childish that we've outgrown, it's not something we need anymore. And so I don't have the answer, but I think it's a really important question. Yeah, I am, I can feel the parallel to that, to my experience of um, what you're saying, Natasha, about like, you know, that you've been playing for for a long time so you're like ready to go and like all in and that other that can be scary for other people i have this um many years as a dancer because i danced so crazily that i would scare people away from the dance floor um and um yeah it took me a long time to realize that that wasn't really you know nice for me or anybody you know to be too silly and i i, I can sometimes have that tendency in play Field as well as being so outlandishly silly that um, nobody feels like they can enter into that space. And um, to me, the learning lesson has been to be really in a generative space. So to be, um, which I think is very connected to mindfulness and kindness, to be um, really present to the people and the situation that are there and to let go of what I thought I wanted to happen. And this, this is a very good learning with children is that um, every time we've done uh, this um, interactive play installations, we have ideas, we have visions of how it's gonna go and how, what's gonna happen. And then the children come and chaos ensues and new things happen and, and creativity comes out of that. And there's this, this spot of letting go of, of, of thinking that I know where things should go or how they should go and being able to like take a little bit of space to allow um, and to respond to what is needed and to see where where there can be like a small invitation that brings people in that need that invitation and I'm still not the best at that I'm very happy to have a partner um, Andrew who, who will be joining us on Sunday who, who was very good at inviting people <laughs> So I'm, I'm still learning. Um, and it is a, it's a very intriguing question, even um, without being there, how do you invite people to play and this idea of the, these, these rocks and uh, what the um, last year in Counterplay, this, this whole project of, of leaving, you know, chalk messages to invite people to play. I think this is um, something that um, I would call play activism, or you could call it kindness activism as well. Um, to, um, I add something, oh, sorry. Yeah, no problem. To, uh, yeah, to, to initiate just a little idea that could possibly bring people into playfulness. Can I add something just um, out of practical uh, meeting with, with Kath, Catherine throughout these days, um, that sometimes really, uh, kindness can be can be not not only because you're inviting something, but just leaving the space for people to um, acknowledge that they can be scared. I mean, a lot of time the word scared came up came out. You know, sometimes play being playful can can be scary. So it's not only a matter of inviting, but really being kind and seeing like. Um, how are you seeing this? How can I understand this better? So kindness, which means really listening to the way the other person feels when, and Natasha before was talking about the bicycle. So you know what that felt. So that's easy to then engage people to come with you and play. So I, this is a, the very strong link that I see between kindness as a way to facilitate people to say, okay, playing is not that scary. Maybe I can go because the, 
the surrounding is is nice and kind and I can step in very at my own um, at my own speed. So just the little thing. Yeah, brilliant, uh, Bea. Um, so now let's just open up to um, if, if anybody else has anything they, they would like to add. And just uh, just remember just to turn off your microphones, please, when, you, when you've spoken. Otherwise, you hear car noises and things like this. So uh, anybody um, have anything that this discussion has, has moved in them that they would like to, like to share? If not, we carry on. Huh? <laughs> So let, I will, I will start, start this, this now. This is what's coming to me. You know, it's um, playfulness and kindness. They both um, have a lot of heart to them. Um, so I suppose we might think of being kind generally as something which is a bit more heartful, you know, because we do that because we generally we're doing it for no other reason than just because the situation is asking me to intervene right now. No, I'm not. Um, I'm doing it spontaneously for, for, to help somebody or, or, or whatever, make them feel, feel better. So then there's this element also playfulness. I really think to, for it to become magic needs a lot of this heartfulness. So what is this heartfulness then in the end? You know, it's, it's this feeling of connection, I suppose. I don't know, I'd like to hear what you have to think about it as well. But for me, it's this, um, it's this question as well that uh, I think is a very important question that we ask ourselves now and it helps us to, to enter into contact with other people. And it's, what does it feel like to be you? No? And if we ask this about anybody, then we start to see where they're coming from and find ways we can interact with them and play with them a little bit. It doesn't even have to be like such an elaborate mental process, you know, it could be just like, just, you just get, jump into this person's shoes, you know, <laughs> and it could be also not just people, it can be animals or plants or anything. And it's a very interesting to come from this point of view. What does it feel like to be you? And then I can interact with you in a different way, which you can be, much more playful than the than the labels that we give things. No? I look around, tree, uh, cup, uh, telephone. You know, and I just don't look at things anymore. So, um, so yeah, this is what I would like to add. So, uh, taking off a slight tangent now. Perhaps any, somebody else will take it on another slight tangent. Two two things that have come up for me thinking about play and kindness. Um, one is I went to a um, play facilitators festival last year just before coming to Counterplay where they work with children in um, play work and the founder of that actually said he doesn't like the word playful because he sees it as um, like it has connotations with spiteful playful like if someone's mean to you and they go oh it's okay I was just playing so the again back to the language of what people's associations are with the term playful and if playfulness to some people can actually be seen as intentionally being unkind but using um i guess playfulness as an excuse to say well actually oh you know lighten up i was just being playful whereas actually that has an undercurrent of being spiteful and on the other flip side of it um for me the work i do and for me the the kind of essence of it is about inclusivity so inclusivity so that whatever game you have can be adapted to whatever mobility you have whatever um, size you are whatever um, athletic ability so for example I personally am drawn to certain games that don't rely on me being able to run from one end of the football pitch to the other the quickest um, also thinking about games that don't necessarily have a winner and a loser. So I know that Kevin's really good at doing more, uh, he, he does work with um, Steiner schools. And so his games often don't really have an end point, like there isn't a winner and a loser at the end of it. It's just playing for the fun of playing and, and interacting with each other. So thinking of playing kindfulness and, and kindness in terms of how the game itself can be adapted to be as kind as possible to whoever is 
interacting without um I mean, even silly things, like I played a game that had um, a piece of string and you were meant to put it around your waist and um, the person who was facilitating was quite slim um, and it didn't fit around my waist. So I, um, yeah, I just kind of worked that out myself, but thinking about when designing play and when designing games, how to make it really so that everyone feels like they can participate without having any, any kind of limitations based on their ability. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that is very beautiful to think about how when we play, how it can be not something that um, has rules that are so tight that you know some people don't fit in them. And what I found in the experimentation of, of uh, being in, in play exploration with Andrew and other people in, in the space that we run here is um, the sweet spot is actually when there's somewhat of a rule but that it actually keeps on changing that there isn't anything fixed and um we, we we've discussed a lot about that that that's actually what's magical about children is that um it's only as we get older that we start having more and more um, fixed rules about like the, that define the game that um uh, many times as children we play a game we start with some rules and then the rules change and evolve and move and are flexible they're not fixed and and yeah to me there's some magic um that i experienced um with kevin lester in counterplay this this way of gaming this idea of um <clears throat> being on the edge of chaos and structure um and finding that sweet spot which um you know it, it has a whole theory play theory around it behind it and um which really resonated with what experientially we had been feeling was special about like finding that place where there's um, there's room for everyone's playfulness whatever that is at whatever level people want to engage but that they find uh, an entrance and it's not limiting by any factor mm. i actually have a question just i'm curious if any of you have experienced what we're talking about in this online format in these last couple months. Because um, I know that a lot of people who are doing things you know, externally have, have done um, online formats. And um, I, I know from a lot of people of, of, of have a feeling of being burnt out and, and being tired from Zoom um, and um, have only experienced in a couple formats um, in social presencing theater. Um, online this feeling of actually being mindful and present and and playful with um, and actually feeling really present with people so i'm wondering if you if you have any experiences um of this this particular format and this this um topic of playfulness and mindfulness and kindness um i'm just going to say something here and then um i found i was giving um uh, kids yoga sessions online and um, what helped me a lot of what helped me feel very present was just with a uh, live stream with Facebook live so I wasn't actually seeing the people I was just giving my, the most I possibly could and uh, just knowing that there were people there and the people would see it afterwards and I found this very helpful to me I wasn't then so worried about the little screens here, you know? I think this is the thing which is a bit baffling with our brains, you know? I have to sort of forget about this, but just give as much as I can, you know, really feel like, whoa. So yeah, that, that, that worked for me. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, this is, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. 
<laughs> um, I'm studying to become a, a chaplain, an interfaith chaplain here. I am in the U.S. I didn't actually say where I was before. Um, and we have very playful types of sessions with each other, with the students. And I feel like over the time with a specific group, we became more interactive. We became more present with each other. It wasn't like when I'm on a meeting or joining a group that I don't know, um, I have a harder time even paying attention. With you guys, it's not the case because, oh my gosh, so much to learn. Um, but I, we just led a um, movement exercise this past week with everyone. And I think the time we had spent with each other, getting to know each other, helped us to trust each other enough to actually do it together. Um, and it was actually very meaningful and I didn't expect it to be. But I just, I really can't help but wonder if just familiarity and trust, um, even in the online space, really helped make that work. Um, anyway. I think that uh, movement is a big part of feeling connected through using these online platforms. Uh, I've worked with kids throughout the whole experience here. And um, I find that when we take moments to do things that are based in movement, whether it's, uh, we played air band a lot. They really liked that one. Um, where you put on some music and they, you know, can pick whatever instrument they want. Um, <clears throat> and it, not only is, it gets them out of their mental space and into their body, but being able to see other people on the screen or being able to turn away from the screen and not see other people gives the opportunity and possibility for taking a little bit more risk than if you had done activities like that in person. And um, I, I found that to be a really effective way of helping helping the kids engage with whatever whatever other activities we were doing if we started with movement based things first. And I wanted to say a little something about um, Anthony. You had mentioned looking more at what exploring the idea of what does it feel like to have the experience of something or to be a particular person or what are the properties of certain things. Um, and by asking questions and digging a bit deeper, by trying to really understand what makes something, uh, I, that to me was the, like I had mentioned in the beginning, one of the biggest parts of mindfulness that I had been thinking about um, is when, like for example, um, you know, you're doing, you're doing your dishes, you're cleaning out, uh, maybe unloading the dishwasher. And that can be, you know, it's a pretty normal everyday experience many of us um, go through and just, you know, just a mundane type of thing. But if we're looking at the properties of a dishwasher or even like the silverware basket, you know, it's, its main purpose is to, is to hold the silverware. But what if it, um, you know, has all of these other, these other things that you consider is the design of the holes or the, um, the orientation that things sit in. And so it's just really started thinking about um, also that it's more than just to, the, to hold objects. Um, and as I started uh, putting silverware away, it became, well, um, if this was like a stadium and the silverware were, uh, <laughs> were the players that showed up, uh, who's coming to play the game? And so it became this whole idea for me about, well, who, who shows up more? Do we have more forks or knives or spoons? And that just depends on whatever experience that I had been having uh, previously with, you know, whatever it was I was eating. So I turned it into this whole idea of um, uh, forks. I find at my house, we use a lot more spoons than anything else. So it became this game, this contest of forks and knives versus the spoons. And as I was uh, putting them away, uh, you know, who, who was going to win? Who showed up more? And so... I really like the idea. I hadn't, wouldn't have gotten to that whole playful uh, experience in my mind if I hadn't been thinking about well, what are the other uh, properties or ideas or um, 
uh, someone on the um, counterplay group at one point in the winter I talked about the thingness about what is it that this object really has besides the purpose that we give to it. And so I think that's a big part of how mindfulness can be the beginning of play of within, you know, within the idea of one particular constraint or one set of limits, which is so like, for example, the dishwasher of how can we explore more of what possibilities are there than what we really uh, typically assign to it. Uh, um, sorry. Um, Lots of ideas. Um, just on Catherine's point, it, your talk about unloading the dishwasher made me think about my favorite, absolute favorite um, kitchen tool, which is really silly, but it's um, in the shape of a whale. And I, you use it to basically drain out the water because it's got holes in it. So it's a bit like, I think it's Fred is the brand, but you've got like Joseph Joseph. So brands like Joseph Joseph who have made kitchen implements fun or Alessio, I think is an Italian brand where they have like dishwasher sticks where they brushes the hair and you know just creative playful things like that where they've taken something that has a functional purpose but given it a personality or given it a character so that there's a bit more of a relationship with when I'm doing the dishes I'm not just doing the dishes I'm putting on my diva plastic rubber gloves that have a huge diamond ring and I'm using my pink neon washing up glove and I'm singing along to Tina Turner and I'm making it this really joyful experience. So um, thank you for reminding me about how awesome my uh, whale is in my kitchen. Um, and Imogen's question about, I'll just read it out for uh, those who aren't reading the chat. Imogen's question is, has anyone had an experience in playfulness or playing games work in mixed language groups and making this inclusive? And so when I, when I do my workshops, I have certain, um, uh, I kind of set the framework and I have uh, words like one is tango. So tango is something I invite you to do, which is stand up and dance around and sit back down again. So feel free to tango. Uh, <laughs> there's other ones and one of them's lingo so you do like this which means I'm not a loser it means I don't understand what language you're saying so feel free to take that with you for workshops later so lingo and then there's other ones I've got but um, I yeah completely agree with Bea in terms of gibberish I actually was lucky enough um, Lottie who did uh, laughter yoga at counterplay I did the gibberish training with her um, she actually had a gibberish workshop yesterday I think so gibberish is great um, and I went to a talk by someone who did play in Romania with children and effectively, I mean, children are the experts. I remember I was told when I was younger, I was in a playground in Hungary and I played for four hours nonstop with a Hungarian child who then became my pen pal to this day without a word of language. So, um, Kevin again, Kevin... Campbell Davidson's a great one. Um, hand games, so things like rock, paper, scissors, you can play that without any words. Um, a lot of mirroring, a lot of gesturing, a lot of bringing the fool, which I know Robbie is great at. So bringing the fool into it, so there's no right and there's no wrong. It's just, we're having a go, we're experimenting. There are no, you know, the rules are implicitly just to be kind. So um, yeah, there, there's been lots of examples with mixed language groups where actually, if you start start it off and just don't necessarily have that many words, which I'm a big word lover, but yeah, so, so gibberish is great and just getting straight in with using body language to show and illustrate how the game works, which is why improv is such a great one to do with that. So um, yeah, implicit rules bear to be kind. That's the main thing. So no one feels left out basically. So if you don't understand what someone's saying, to have, and also to have the confidence to say, you know what, I don't know what's going on, what is happening, um, and have the power to say that and, and invite that in to say from the beginning, if you don't know what's going on, just say it's absolutely fine. So thank you, Imogen, for the question. I would um, <clears throat> thank, thank you, uh, Natasha. I would like to uh, try and round this up now. So um, we could do this in lots of different ways, but perhaps just uh, let's just say, um, a sentence or a couple of a couple of words each that uh, 
that, uh, that this session has brought up for us. So um, we, we can all unmute ourselves now, actually, probably. <laughs> I'm just even, the, even the people not not in the, in the, in the panel, just a, a sentence or a couple of words. I'm going to finish by saying that um, I'm going to take the rules adapting and say that I'm going to take Imogen's request. And in my holiday session on Sunday, when we go off to Italy, we're going to do a bit of gibberish as part of that for our language translation on, on holiday. So thank you, Imogen. You've contributed to my workshop on Sunday. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> okay, go for it, Catherine. Three words or a sentence about this. Um, I I really like uh, Natasha's idea of being really intentional in designing playful uh, activities with the idea of inclusivity as an act of kindness itself. Okay, Benji. Yeah, what, what's come up for me is that I think that um, true mindfulness is always playful and kind. Hmm. But well, I got no word, but I uh, I really like this conversation, and uh, I think it's a very kind conversation, and. It's uh, it's another form of playfulness, and uh, I like that. Thank you. Okay, just a couple more of people. Bea. Well, I, I agree with Bart, and I just taking one thing: uh, in, invite uh, kindly to play. Invite mm -hmm. kindly, just whatever, and then maybe play comes or, or something else comes. Okay. Come. Cool. cool. Kara. Hey, I really love the idea of mindfulness being the beginning of play, sort of a bridge to play for adults who have discarded the word and don't understand what it is. It's a great way to open the conversation. Hmm. Okay, brilliant. Anybody else? Uh, anybody else on the panel? Uh, like uh, watching the panel? If not, I understand. Eh? This is also like a bit of a hardcore invitation, you know? It's like it can feel a bit, uh, a bit much. So um, perhaps just like around it off here then. So uh, um, thank you all for, for, for coming along for this channel, uh, for this conversation. And I think it's, um, it keeps working. It will, this will work inside us. So uh, see you at the next session. There's lots of things going on. <laughs> thank you, Bart. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, we have um, Anna Marie now and we also have Stefan at five o'clock. And uh, lots of other things following. So, uh, so ciao. <laughs> Discover how to live a more playful life. The Playful Life Podcast. Here we go with Antonitra Hare as your host.